Ministries, where truth is revealed, explained, and visualized. This is a second video of Difficult Conversations, and we are going to be looking at the topic Divorce and Remarriage. Indeed, it's a difficult conversation. It is difficult uh, theologically. It is difficult socially. might be sensitive to some, but I hope by God's grace that we could all learn something new together and that we can allow the Bible to be our final authority on the choices that we make. Let's pray as we begin our study. Dear Father, we thank you again for today. Thank you for the gift of life and technology. I pray that we'll be using it to your honor and glory. I pray that your spirit would help us to correctly interpret, apply, and understand the scriptures that we are going to examine as we try to understand a little bit more about divorce and remarriage. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, let's examine the evidence. There's, there's so much that we could look at, and I want to just get right into it. God hates divorce. That has never, never been his will. If you look at Malachi chapter 2, 14 to 16, you'd realize that God calls putting away the same thing as dealing with someone treacherously. In just three verses, he mentions it three times. God hates divorce because it is dealing with your partner treacherously. It causes pain and agony. And you would realize specifically in verse 15 that it reduces or there I even say eliminates the, the, the chances of creating a godly seed. One of the main reasons why God hates divorce is not just because of the, the emotional turmoil between the two parties. He also hates divorce because of how it affects the children. And I want you to think about that. Now, if God hates divorce, why allow it? Why would God allow divorce at all? If you hate it, then you should not allow it. But we will realize that in, in the wisdom of God, in the character of God, and, and as you go throughout the Bible, not everything allowed by Scripture is preferred. Not everything allowed by God is preferred by God. And we can see Paul understanding the, the wisdom of this choice. Yes, he might be allowed to do anything, you know, and, and someone is saying that to him. You might say, I am allowed to do everything. But not everything is good for you. And, and that's, that's what I want you to realize. Not everything allowed is preferred. Not because the Bible permits it as something that you can do doesn't mean that the Bible recommends that it's something that you should do. Let's look at a few examples in scripture. The difference between what's allowed and what's actually preferred. Example number one. God allowed the consumption of flesh food because of the circumstances surrounding the flood. But God preferred that our diet continue to be plant-based because he created our bodies and he gave us exactly what we need for our bodies. God allowed judges. And you look at the scripture and you realize in Judges 1 and 2 that the reason why God allowed judges is because of the perpetual sins of the children of Israel and being caught in captivity. That is why judges were raised up to deliver them or to alleviate the pressures that were caused by those that had them in captivity. But what did God prefer? God always preferred prophets. He always preferred prophets because when he has a prophet, he has someone that he could directly speak to so that the children of Israel can receive information from him. Did God raise judges? Yes, he did. But was it that was that what he preferred? That is not the case. Did God give Noah and his family the instruction to consume flesh food? Yes, it was his instruction. But was it his preference? Is that something he preferred? No, that's not the case. 
Quail is another good example in scripture, but he preferred that they consume manna. Manna was beneficial to them for their health. They were never sick as long as they ate manna and followed God's instructions. They were not sick for the entire 40-year trip. But the moment they, they got quail, many of them died. Thousands of them died. God allowed them to have a king. But what did God prefer? God preferred theocracy. He preferred to be their king. And that's why he told Samuel, listen, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. Did he allow them to have a king? Yes. In fact, God played a part in the choosing of a king. But was that his preference? No. His preference was always to be their king rather than to choose a king for them. Similarly, he allows divorce, but he always prefers faithfulness. He always prefers that the marriage is done between two individuals according to his will, being done according to his will, and then the marriage experience itself should be maintained according to his will as well. That is what God prefers. So yes, I want you to understand that while God allows divorce, the Bible also says that he hates divorce. So with that in mind, of course, you know, we live in a world where these things happen. And thank God again, anticipating that these things would take place, he has given us counsel so that we can do it the right way. Yes. And we will see that the Bible also provides grounds for divorce. Let's look at one of them. Infidelity. The Bible is clear, infidelity is one of the grounds for a biblically legitimate divorce. The Bible says here in Matthew 5.32, But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Matthew 19 verse 9, pretty similar, but you, if, you, if you look at the text closely, there is a difference. I'll not tell you what it is. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. Now the question is, what is the context of this conversation? Why is it that Christ has to be specific in giving grounds for divorce. Let's, let's observe the context of the conversation here. According to Matthew chapter 19, verse 3 and 7, it says that the Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And then Christ responds, and then they rebut by asking, it says here, verse 7, they say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and put her away? And, and to put her away. Now, if you look at that text closely, you'd realize the Pharisees are, they seem to be suggesting something. They, they, they seem to be suggesting something. And I, and I want to ask the Pharisees that question. What exactly are they insinuating when they use the writings of Moses to suggest that you could divorce the individual for any reason? Is that something that Moses actually commanded them to do? I find command to be quite a conveniently strong word for the argument of the Pharisees. So let's let's now go into what Moses actually said in Deuteronomy chapter 24, 1 and 2. It says here, When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement. Now, you'd realize that look, just looking at the passage, Divorce was allowed. Divorce was suggested, not commanded, not recommended, not promoted. It was 
allowed. Now, the Pharisees are, are doing some ICGCs here. And it seems to me here that if they were to find any reason to divorce, they would. And, and that's how the Pharisees are misapplying the text. So you see, you need to understand, first of all, that Moses never commanded divorce. It was allowed, it was suggested at best, but in no way does the text insinuate that he commanded them to divorce as soon as they find an issue with the woman. Jesus himself agreed, and you'd realize in Matthew 19 verse 8, he also said that Moses suffered, that is epitrepsin. He allowed you to put away your wives. Understand that the text is very clear and the, the Pharisees are going further than what the text actually says. It was allowed, not recommended, not commanded, not promoted. It was allowed. And I want you to see why that is so significant. Now, Jesus goes further than what they asked him. And he goes as far as indicating that the reason why this was allowed was because of the hardness of your hearts. Now, why is that so important? You see, the hardness of heart is what crushed the biblical mandate of marriage. And that's what I want you to realize. The original intention for marriage has been blurred by 400 years of Egyptian culture. So the hardness of heart among the Israelites led them to misuse marriage. So Moses, because of the hardness of their hearts, Moses had to allow divorce to put a stop to the extent of evil that would take place within the marriage. Whatever they misused the marriage for, divorce was a better option. Divorce was a safer option. So I want you to see here, and, 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 and again, I am not trying to justify divorce, but I'm trying to help you understand the context of the situation in which divorce was suggested. You see, I, I want you to realize that divorce was allowed to counter the misuse of marriage. Divorce was not allowed to promote the annulment of marriage. That is so important to make that distinction. So you don't have that situation where Hagar experienced constructive dismissal. You can Google that and check it out. You know, the Bible says that Hagar was so badly mistreated by Sarah that she ran away. And this is why you, you need to understand the difference between civil laws and moral laws. Civil laws are made to put a limit to the extent of evil, but moral laws condemn all evil. Civil laws are kept, they are made for the unconverted. But moral laws are kept by those who are converted. Civil laws address outward actions. But moral laws address both the inward and the outward action. The breaking of civil laws would give you punitive temporal judgment, but the breaking of moral law, the wages of sin, will always be eternal death. The reason I'm making this point is because divorce is a civil law. It's not a moral law. It's a civil law. It was, it was specifically allowed because of the hardness of their hearts. And that's why civil laws are so important. So the, the Bible condemns murder even when it begins in the heart. Tell me, what civil law can you make for that? Can you make a civil law for hatred? No, but the moral law condemns hatred. Can you make a civil law for lusting after a woman? No, but you can make a law for rape. You can make a law for, for molestation. You can make a law for, for the act, the outward action. The moral law goes deeper than that. It addresses the motive, the emotion, the thought, the intention. You see? So this is why 
The hardness of heart was brought up by Christ so that they could realize, listen, we are not supposed to be plateauing our Christian experience on civil laws. No. And this is why he's rebuking the Pharisees because clearly they're missing the entire point. God's intention has always been for Israel to have his moral law written in their hearts and in their minds. That has always been God's intention. Anybody that keeps the moral law through the grace and power of Christ, the civil law is that that's a walk in the park for them. There's no issue there. Because of the hardness of their hearts, because of, of their failure to meet the requirements of the moral law, civil laws were put in place to put a check on them. This is why Christ has to provide some clarification on the civil law that was provided by Moses. Christ is not con contradicting Moses here. So, divorce was allowed because the hardness of their hearts led them to misuse marriage. What Christ is doing in, in Matthew 5 and Matthew 19 is that he is showing them or he is addressing the misuse of divorce. Let me say that again. Divorce was allowed by Moses to counter the misuse of marriage. Christ is bringing up the grounds for divorce to counter the misuse of divorce because they were divorcing for any reason. So Christ now has to counter that and, and put a check on that as well and help them understand that it is only for the cause of fornication. And that's why that's what Moses meant when he said, if there is any uncleanness in her. So they thought it was ceremonial uncleanness. So if she had a period, I could divorce her and you could find that in Leviticus. No, it was not ceremonial uncleanness, but rather it was a moral uncleanness. It was a violation of the marriage covenant. That was the uncleanness. So Christ had to be specific so that they could realize that the grounds for divorce would be fornication. And any trivial issue outside of that is not grounds for divorce. According to Manuscript Releases, Volume 17, page 156, paragraph 1, it says, A woman may be legally divorced from her husband by the laws of the land, and yet not divorced in the sight of God and according to the higher law. There is only one sin, which is adultery, which can place the husband or wife in a position where they can be free from the marriage vow in the sight of God. Although the laws of the land may grant a divorce, yet they are husband and wife still in the Bible light according to the laws of God. It is important that we understand the context of the instructions given by Christ so that we could see how it applies. Listen, there are so many other things we need to answer. What about abuse? What about the unbelieving spouse? This difficult conversation has gone on quite long enough. We will stop here for now. This is just part one of this difficult conversation. In our next video, we will answer some other issues that surround the grounds for divorce and remarriage. For now, my friends, let's not lose sight of the perfect will of God. Yes, divorce is allowed, but he has continually promoted faithfulness in the marriage. Let's ensure that we allow God to choose our partners and sustain our marriages. I hope that you are blessed by this video. Please like, subscribe, hit that notification bell. And by the way, difficult conversations are much easier to have if you know how to study the Bible. Keys for Study is a series for you. Check out Keys for Study. You won't regret it. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Trev Ministries over and out.